Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends, where our goal is to show and grow a passion for studying God's Word. And I'm here, we're going to finish up today with my friend, Jason Wilson. And we're going to be... I'll take it. That's <laughs> okay. How you doing, Jason? Oh, you okay? And I'm excited about finishing our, our book of Titus together. We're going to be looking today specifically at the last verses from, from verse 8 to verse 15 of Titus uh, chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at profitable and unprofitable actions of believers. This is the very last of Paul's message to young Pastor Titus. Remember, this is actually Bishop Titus because he's over all the churches in Crete. And he's going to be talking about what are profitable things and unprofitable things that believers should be doing in their life. And we're going to see that when we come right back. So hi, and welcome back to Bible Study with Friends. As I said, I'm here with Jason Wilson, and Jason and I are, are finishing up this great study. We've enjoyed this book of Titus, and we're going to finish up today. Now, this is a real Bible study. There's no script. There's no rehearsal. This is two guys getting together and just looking at the word and we're going to be asking you to join in and enjoy it if it's a blessing hit the subscribe button hit the like button comment we've already gotten some great comments about titus and we uh, hope that continues to be honest with you yeah. there's not a lot out there on titus no one ever preaches on it no one ever really teaches on it and i don't know why because it's a great little book and it's been a great series but this is our conclusion yeah. to the book. And we're going to talk about today this idea of profitable and unprofitable actions of believers. Now, you know, I was thinking the other day when we started this, is when you think about it in the beginning, he was going to talk about salvation and he goes into false teaching. And so for him to have changed what he was going to talk about, there had to have been some urgency going on there. And I, I don't understand, but there, there's an urgency now. I feel like in this world yeah, to teach the book like this, but and I think I think this the very end of this this last this conclusion really can apply to a, a lot of us in the in the church today. I think there are a lot of Christians who are spinning their wheels. They're really wasting their time doing some things yeah. that are not profitable for the body of Christ, nor profitable for their own spiritual growth. Yeah. And this is really contemporary to today. We're going to start at verse 8 with this comment that Paul makes, and it's not a unique comment. He has made it a number of times. In fact, I've got right up here in my notes this idea of Paul saying this is a trustworthy statement. He says it in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says it again in 1 Timothy 3.1. He says it again to, in 1 Timothy 4.9. He says it again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, and now he's saying it to Titus. So when he's talking to his young pastor friends, Paul uses this comment, this is a trustworthy statement. So from verse 9, 8 to verse 11, here's the trustworthy statement. Paul is saying, listen, Titus, you can trust what I'm saying here. This is important. This is worthy of your trust this is trustworthy concerning these things i want you to speak confidently and this is one of the things about being a believer this is an action of believers that is profitable and that is to speak confidently about the word of god and about sound doctrine and what's profitable and what's not now if you don't know so you can't confidently speak, then it's a time to take the action of finding out. And that's where things like Bible study with friends comes in because you can watch this video and many videos in our playlist and get a good idea of sound doctrine so that you can speak confidently. So I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God would be careful 
to engage in good deeds. That's the next action. That's great. What question can we ask ourselves from that? When it, he says, uh, this is a trustworthy statement. I want you to help believers be careful to engage in good deeds. What's, what can we ask ourselves immediately? Yeah. A, a, and am I being careful to engage in good deeds? Yeah. In other words, being careful to engage in good deeds means we're not just doing good deeds to do good deeds. Yeah. We're th doing some thinking about it. You and I were talking about making some decisions on doing some things, and we're thinking about what we're doing. We're thinking about it. We're not just doing stuff automatically, and uh, frankly, we don't even know what we're doing half the time. <laughs> we're, we're being careful to consider what we're doing so that we can engage in good deeds with a full mind, really thinking about it. These things are good and profitable. There's where we get this idea of profitable and unprofitable. These things are good and profitable for men and women. All right. He's just talking about believers here. And he says, but. Now, when we come to a but in English, that means that what we're about to read is a contrast with what we just read. So he's been talking about speaking confidently. He's been talking about being careful to engage in good deeds and doing things that are profitable, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And frankly, a lot of Christians get sucked into controversies, and many of them are foolish controversies. I remember one time going to a Bible study at Christmas time, and there was a big, huge discussion about whether our Christmas trees should be decorated. And if they were decorated, should we use colored balls on our Christmas? It was this big art discussion. What a foolish thing to be wasting our time when we could be in the Word of God. Yeah. <laughs> so Christians, don't get sucked in. It says here, this is a command, very strong in the Greek, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies now genealogies are interesting here now this could speak to our mormon friends who are very interested in genealogies but this idea about genealogies and controversies about genealogies is where i'm of a certain genealogy and you're not so somehow i am superior or inferior or there's a huge difference in us because we come from different backgrounds. That's just crazy. And it's foolishness. And it says, avoid foolish controversies, avoid genealogies, and avoid strifes and disputes about the law. Now, this is not our justice system in the U.S. This is strifes and disputes about what is good and pleasing to God to, to do? Those profitable and engaging good deeds. Don't get involved in, in strifes in, where, in fighting about that. If somebody, I, I remember we were starting a church in an extremely wealthy section of Dallas. And because there were no churches up there. And rich people need the gospel. That's clear in the scriptures that many rich people Jesus talks to. But I had this young seminary student come and say, why are you wasting your time with a church for rich people when we should be doing a church for homeless? Well, in Dallas, there were a ton of ministries to the homeless and to the poor, but not many ministries to the wealthy. And, but he was all ready to go to the mat fighting about our actions, our engaging in good deeds, and the care we were doing. And this idea of, I'm ready to fight and have strife over what I think is good deeds as compared to what you're doing for the Lord. There are many good deeds. Remember in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, it talks about the eye can't say to the hand, you're worthless. And the uh, foot, the body can't say to the foot, you're worthless. 
everybody has a significant role in the church. We should not be fighting over whether we're hands or feet for the gospel. And that's this idea of, that's an unprofitable pursuit. It says, avoid these things because they are unprofitable. Now, up here, we've got profitable things. And here we've got unprofitable. And just take a second on your own, read these verses, and think about what's profitable in my life right now, and what is unprofitable in my life right now as a believer. Am I arguing about politics? Am I arguing about all kinds of things that have nothing to do with sound doctrine and speaking confidently of the doctrine we have as Christians? That Does that resonate with you, Jason? Yeah, absolutely. And now he's going to talk about people in the church. He's saying, now, besides avoiding these things, we should reject the men who are proponents of these things. It says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. This factious is, I, I want to have a faction over here, and I'm of a faction over here, and, and I want to fight about our factions. To reject a factious man. This is a man who goes after disunity instead of unity. And we're going after unity in the body. It says, re reject them after the first or second warning. It said, go come to them and say, hey, brother, you're being divisive here. And then you reject them because you know that such a man is perverted and is sinning and being self-condemned. He's self-condemned because he is disobeying these rules about uh, avoid these things, right? Now, that actually ends the letter, the, the actual letter. But then he gives final instructions in the way of kind of greetings. He says, when I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, now, Artemis and Tychicus, he is sending them with this letter. They're going to be carrying this letter. And he says, when I send them to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So he's out of, he's out of prison. He's on a break from prison. He's going to go back soon for the second arrest and the final arrest. But he says, I've decided to go to Nicopolis for the winter and come and join me there. And it says, diligently help Zenus the lawyer. And Apollos on their way. Now, Zenus and Apollos apparently were traveling together and ministering together. Apollos was an evangelist. We see him in the book of Acts when he comes in and Priscilla and Aquila help him understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit and send him on his way as a traveling mission. And apparently, Zenus the lawyer is traveling with him. Now, what's your, you are a lawyer, <laughs> Jason, and I'm not going to hold that against you, but Sorry. We see here, I've had guys get all excited. Hey, listen, there's a Christian lawyer. And that is true, but the term lawyer here is not uh, a legal legal person who takes care of ca court cases. That in the New Testament culture was an advocate, okay? But when he's talking about the lawyer, he's talking about somebody who is an expert in the Old Testament law. They are law -er. <laughs> literally yeah yeah so he's talking about help zenos now what's that interesting for us is that means that there were guys who were experts in the old testament who were absolutely believers who we wanted to send on their trip that he was traveling with apollos and i imagine that would have been a dynamic thing about talking about how the old testament law the pentateuch the first five books of the law the torah applied to Christian living. And he says, uh, send them on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. I, I think of, of third John, when it talks about there were traveling missionaries and we need to send them on their way. And by that, we participate in their ministry. This is a profitable thing. We see Artemis and Tychicus doing a profitable thing of carrying a letter to Tychus, to Titus. And then we see Titus and the church churches in Crete doing a profitable thing of sending Zenos and Apollos on their way and providing for them. Our people must also learn. Now, 
This is what do you get when, with this term, our people? I think we're still talking about believers here. We're talking about believers, but the church. It, it's interesting that Paul is in, is including himself in the leadership of the church. He doesn't say your people need to do this. He's saying our people. In, so it's even a wider application than just the churches in Crete, right? Yeah, our people. Mean, he comes off talking about Zenos and Apollos on their way and made sure that they're helped so they're not lacking for anything so there's something obviously they are to learn as well in doing their diligence and doing what they're or doing what they're supposed to do yeah and probably the same for artemis and uh, tacticus and uh, whatever so now then the next word in that statement where this is almost the last thing here sir he said the, the our people what must our yeah. Our believers, us as believers, you as a believer in Jesus, must learn to engage in good deeds to meet the pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Now, that's interesting, that second phrase, so that they will not be unfruitful, is two things. We meet needs of people like Zenos and Apollos so that they're fruitful. And in the meeting of their needs, we become fruitful. And so by learning to engage in good works, we help others be fruitful, and we ourselves are fruitful. And if you don't do it, you're unfruitful. And so this is the idea he's saying here, do these good needs and meet pressing needs in the church and in missionaries and in ministries like Bible study with friends, so that they could mean our people, but it could also mean the people that have the needs. And then it says, all who are with me greet you. Remember, he had in the first imprisonment and coming out of the first imprisonment, he had a whole team of people that were coming and going and delivering mail and doing all kinds of things. He says, everybody who are with me greet you. So Titus, he used to be part of that team, yeah. and now he's a bishop over the Crete. And they, he says, hey, all the guys, everybody here greets you, and greet those who love us in the faith. So basically, everybody here says hi. Be sure to say hi to everybody there. Yeah. And then he ends with this very typical thing for Paul. Grace be with you all. Not just Titus, but grace be with you all. And you and I are included in that all. Yeah. And then we find that's finishing. So we can think about from 8 to verse 15, we can see a lot of examples and we can see some specific commands. Avoid this, do this. In fact, be careful to do this. And we must, as believers, learn to engage in good works. Going to church and sitting on our hands in church and saying, boy, that was a great message. I love that music. That was terrific. Then going home and that's it. That's not engaging in good works. And we must be careful to engage in good deeds. And with that, we'll end our overview of the book of Titus. There's a lot of things in Titus. Sound doctrine getting our salvation straight and things to avoid and things to do. And he talks about good deeds a lot. So there's a lot in Titus that we can apply to our lives that are crucial. You have any finishing comments on our book? I really enjoyed that. I'm teaching you to be careful. Now, I think that's the most underrated statement in your walk. And a lot of times we're real flippant with things and we don't think before we act and we just claw off the handle, whether it be, no matter what it is the case, I, I remember, I remember you telling me years ago about praying, you were going to witness to someone and you prayed about a shirt you were going to purchase so there wouldn't be a distraction in your walk and you're evangelizing this, this person. And so I always use that as an example, even my own life, but I tell people, say, we should be so careful as to do those things, the tiniest things that you think aren't important. Yeah. 
Um, and that I've made decisions not to buy certain cars because I thought the car would be making the wrong statement about my life and my pursuit of things. Yeah. And so I lived a what what's the word? A conscience. I think you were very cognizant of what. Yeah. I, I, I didn't go into automatic. I right. just kind of, I'm just going through life and everything's fine. I just get deliberated. <laughs> I don't have to think about anything. But boy, there's a word that I can't think of that it's it's a it's a living a life that is de deliberate. Yeah. All right. Deliberate. Yeah. I want to be deliberate in my actions as a Christian. I want to be deliberate in what is going to advance the gospel. And right. what's going to advance my witness as yeah. a Christian with yeah. my non-Christian friends, but also what's going to minister to my Christian friends. Yeah. Yeah. And I need to be deliberate in how I live. And that's really, I think that is the essence of the message of Titus. Yeah. Is think about being deliberate in what you believe, how you believe it, and what you do about that belief. Yeah. And uh, I think this has right. been a great book. Same here. I want to thank you guys on YouTube. I hope you thought it was a great book. And I hope you got something out of this series. If this was the first time you've been watching this, go back to our first lesson in Titus and get a feel for the whole book of Titus. It flows very beautifully under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And yeah. we pray that this has been a blessing. And if it has, subscribe, hit the like button, comment. We'd love to hear that. And listen, now Jason and I are going to think about another Bible study to do together in our Bible study with friends series. And listen, in the meantime, we hope you develop a passion for studying God's word. And until then, we'll see you. God bless you.